and a good Tuesday evening to you. Thank you for taking some time out of your night to join us here for our study. This is a part 35 of a contextual study on the hope of Israel, the resurrection of the dead. Uh, we've made our way through the Old Testament. We're peering into the New Testament. We've covered uh, Matthew chapter 22, Mark chapter 9. Tonight, we're going to look at First and Second Thessalonians. And many of you know, I had said a couple of weeks ago that I was going to restructure uh, the, the notes there, the, uh, the, the sessions, because I wanted us to continue to go in chronological order uh, as we journey through the New Testament. So uh, now you know, uh, I look at, I take the um, Matthean priority uh, perspective, where I believe Matthew was uh, one of the early texts, Mark being another early text, Galatians being nestled in there. However, I don't know too many that argue there's resurrection text in the book of Galatians. Uh, however, uh, Thessalonians would be our next uh, contextual uh, aspect of looking at the resurrection. So tonight we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, the verses, a couple of verses within each of those chapters, and I pray it will help us continue to go down this, uh, this road that we've been going, gaining clarity regarding the hope of Israel and the resurrection of the dead. Uh, that being said, I'm Mike Miano. I serve as the pastor here at the Blue Point Bible Church. For the sake of this study, I'm the apologist through MGW Apologetics. The goal of MGW Apologetics is to encourage the saints, the Christian church for that matter, in a zeal empowered by knowledge, that we would not have no knowledge, uh, as we know God's people were destroyed for their lack of knowledge, uh, and that we would not have a zeal for God without knowledge. Um, which unfortunately we see the Apostle Paul lamenting about his generation in Romans chapter 10. So let us be those who endeavor to gain knowledge and then have a zeal that complements the knowledge that we've attained about our Lord. Amen. Let's go ahead and praise him this evening and pray uh, that he will lead our study as I trust he will, and then we'll jump right in on some discussion for tonight's session. Let's pray. Mighty God, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, for being the God of gods, for being the King of kings, Lord, for being our personal savior. So many titles, Lord, we can use to lift up praise to your name. Uh, so many ways that we can approach you, Lord, and, and know that you've been a God who has provided all things pertaining to life and godliness. Uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, we have this time to look into these this important topic, the resurrection of the dead, the hope of Israel. Uh, for we know, Lord, the apostles said that they preach nothing other than that one hope, that one hope being fulfilled through you. So we thank you. We thank you for your providence. We thank you for your sovereignty. And we ask that you continue to show that as we go through our study tonight. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear as we journey through these texts, as we relish our identity in you, and as we appreciate the fellowship we have with one another. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this past Sunday, I actually had the privilege to preach at the Blue Point Bible Church a sermon titled, The Corporate Body View. And uh, this actually is, I guess I'm going to begin with the end here. Uh, next week, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, in our study. And uh, that being said, uh, we've been journeying through 1 Corinthians 15 in the sermon series here at the Blue Point Bible Church. So I believe that when you look at 1 Corinthians 15, uh, let's say verses 35 to about 48, just throwing out some numbers there within that range, uh, that text really highlights for us what we're calling the corporate body view. Many of you know I've taught and I teach uh, the corporate body view of uh, the resurrection of the dead. So uh, I am, I'm overly excited to move in on next week. Uh, however, I do want to let you know I will be uploading uh, the sermon that I preached this past Sunday, uh, Redone. Yeah, another topic for another time, folks. Uh, however, um, I'll be doing the uploading that by Thursday. So you will have my notes and my, uh, the, my audio from that part six, I think, or part seven uh, of 1 Corinthians 15 by this Thursday. That'll give you opportunity to study ahead for our 1 Corinthians 15 look next Tuesday evening. Another thing I want to share to you uh, from some of my personal studies would be this quote that I came across this morning that I shared about four years ago. The tension in understanding certain end times expectations is in our contemporary lack of understanding how important the standing again of the dead ones would have been to the Jewish mind. You see, in our contemporary culture, we actually lamented this this past Sunday in our adult Sunday school. We don't have a very collective or corporate way of looking at the world. Most of the time we know it's me, myself, and I. Uh, that's what's important. That's what I need to lead. And of course, I think maybe we can include our families and the things that we might deem important. However, 
the Western culture has by and large missed this, uh, the importance of the collective understanding that we find our identity within the groups that we are in. And uh, you see the, the Old Testament, of course, and the first century saints, uh, they would have understood that collective idea. And they would have known how important it was for the old covenant dead, those who God had spoke to and, and dealt with, uh, for them to receive what was promised to them. And unfortunately, being that we're so individual focused in our current day society, we miss how the New Testament is highlighting how important it was for the old covenant dead folks, the, you know, the old covenant dead, we'll call them, to be raised again, to be brought into the presence of God, because God had promised them. We journeyed through the Old Testament and we saw again and again this picture of wrath and salvation, wrath and salvation. If you remember uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they really highlight that theme. And uh, that's actually going to be important as we look at some text tonight in Thessalonians. So again, I believe by and large, one of the biggest problems we have is most folks, let's face it, are waiting for an individual body or are waiting for some sort of personal experience regarding resurrection. And they demand that to be the end all of end times prophecy. Whereas what we're reading through the Old Testament and the New Testament is how the old covenant people were promised that they would be judged and resurrect, well, they would be resurrected and judged and given opportunity to have restored relationship with God, that which was lost going all the way back to the story of Adam. And again, I believe that's what one of the biggest problems in our contemporary culture is, is we fail to see how important the old covenant people would have been to a first century audience. Another uh, thing I'd like to mention this evening is a blog I wrote just recently. Uh, if you go to powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, uh, you can read the one of 14. Uh, that was a, a quote used by Doug Wilson to talk about full preterism. He said that there's about 14 of us, and that's why he doesn't believe it's that important to respond to. So here I am, one of the 14 uh, that felt it was necessary to respond. And uh, you could go ahead and review my blog and my response to Doug Wilson's uh, charge there. And what I said in that video, and I'm going to try to uh, summarize this, was or what I said in that article, for that matter, was that most folks don't understand the difference between pre-AD 70. If someone posited that the dead had been raised prior to AD 70, prior to the destruction of the power of the holy people, prior to the fulfillment of all things, uh, every jot and tittle for that matter, uh, if the resurrection happened prior to that, that would have been very problematic. As we know, the Apostle Paul marks it out as heresy, that there were some teaching the resurrection was in the past in, let's say, 68 or even 66 AD. And that was a problem in the church. And Doug Wilson goes on to say uh, that, you know, so they were wrong by a couple months, you know, maybe what, 48 months uh, for that matter. And, and how can that be heresy? And then the full preterist view, which says that the resurrection of the dead is in the past, but only after AD 70. Um, he seems to misunderstand that. And I believe that's very important for each of us to understand. So what he had done, Doug Wilson, in his video, was he went through 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 2, texts that most of us full preterists are familiar with because they're used against us constantly. Uh, he talked about how uh, if you're saying the resurrection is in the past, you've put away a good conscience, uh, 1 Timothy 1.19. You've uh, shipwrecked your faith. You've fallen into blasphemy. You deserve to be delivered over to Satan. You've given way to profane and empty chatter. Uh, you are a part of a view that causes you to grow up in ungodliness, a view that will grow like cancer and gangrene. Uh, you will fall into error from the truth, and you will overthrow the faith of some. Uh, this view overthrows the faith of some. Now, he wants to make that charge for those that believe in a post-AD 70 resurrection that or, or AD 70 resurrection for that matter, and that we believe that reality is ours after AD 70. I would make the charge that that was for those that believed in a resurrection prior to AD 70. So a good challenge uh, to go back through those texts, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 2 Timothy 2, uh, and ask yourself would be, why did and does positing a pre-AD 70 resurrection cause one to, and again, I said all those points, Put away good conscience, shipwreck their faith, fall into blasphemy, deserve to be delivered over to Satan, etc. I encourage you to think about that. Why would it have been such a big deal? And I already hinted at it. Because again, we see Daniel chapter 12 says that the shattering of the power of the holy people will be a sign for the resurrection of the dead. 
well, did the shattering of the power of the holy people happen prior to AD 70? Uh, or AD 60, you know, even AD 66, we know Titus gathered his troops, topic for another time. That's where we might have seen the beginning of the wrath of God. However, in AD 70 was when the temple was destroyed, the city was destroyed, and it would have made very clear to the saints uh, Christ's effective work and what Christ had said to that generation. So I encourage you to go back and review that. Look forward to my sermon from this Sunday. Uh, continue to think about the importance of the standing again of the dead ones, which is a great encouragement to be here next Tuesday night, and go visit that blog that I mentioned at powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. I believe you will be encouraged. So in review, we're now in a part 35 of this study. And many of you know, going back to March of last year, I preached at the Holston, Holston PBU Church in Rogersville, Tennessee, and I had the privilege of sharing the corporate body view. And the outworking of that is this study where I said I would put together a host of texts that support my claim uh, that the corporate body view is the truth of resurrection rather than, let's say, the individual body at death view, which is a preterist view held by some, uh, Ed Stevens most specifically, excuse me, and uh, or the popular traditional, you know, individually focused resurrection that's going to happen sometime in our yet future. Uh, obviously, I believe that to be erroneous. So, what we've been doing here, these 35 sessions, have been the outworking of uh, my hermeneutic and me showing you why it is that I've come to the understanding that I have. Now, going back to our very first couple of sessions we began, we looked at the beginning of the Bible, and we talked about three specific types of death that we would highlight going on there the day that Adam ate of the tree. We said covenant death, uh, that Adam violated the covenant, and we uh, obviously our proof text would be Hosea chapter 6 where it says, like Adam, speaking about Israel, they had violated the covenant. So we see that very clearly. Hosea is telling us that Adam violated the covenant. Therefore, we can understand that the covenant death, we, we see covenant death right there in Genesis chapter two. We also highlighted fellowship death. Many of you know, I often refer to what happened with Adam and Eve as fellowship death rather than what some call spiritual death, simply because I don't like that phraseology. I don't believe that's what's going on there. Uh, rather, the day Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, his fellowship with God was changed. How do we know that? Well, Adam's hiding from God. He's hiding from the God that placed him in the garden. So uh, that right there should show you their fellowship was changed. They were, it was dead. Uh, if you know me and you are fellowshipping and uh, we're supposed to be in harmony with one another and you begin to hide from fellowship with me, it's safe to say that our fellowship has died. And then of course, relationship death. What do we see happen next? Now we see God take Adam and set him outside the Garden of Eden, and uh, obviously a picture of that relationship being severed, that beautiful relationship God had created by placing Adam in the Garden of Eden. I might uh, highlight that actually in 1 Thessalonians 1, one of the texts we're going to look at tonight years ago, I preached where it talks about how uh, his choice of you. I often make the claim, I ask folks, how did Adam end up in the Garden of Eden? Did he wander there? Did he think it was a better place than the place he was living? Or did God place him there? And I believe that's a soteriological detail, that just as God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden, so he places us in Christ. And of course, I, I uh, highlight 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, knowing brethren beloved by God, his choice of you. So uh, I see right from the very beginning this picture of soteriology happening with the Garden of Eden. So yes, the death that we saw happen there was covenant death, fellowship death, and relationship death. And therefore, as we journey further in the biblical narrative, the hope is for each of those deaths to be done away with, for covenant to be restored, for fellowship to be restored, and ultimately relationship to be restored. And it shouldn't shock us that our Bible ends with what? He is our God, and we are his people, restored relationship. So let's go ahead and jump right in where we're at tonight. Uh, First Thessalonians, and I've already mentioned that I believe the Thessalonian letters to be uh, rather early in the chronology of the New Testament, uh, contrary to the way your Bible is put together. And uh, I believe that the Thessalonian letters were one of the earliest letters uh, written to the different churches uh, that Paul had planted. So tonight, what I'd like us to look at, I know I mentioned verse four, but I want us to really lean in on verses nine through 10. And I'm going to go ahead and read them to you out of the NASB Bible. For they themselves report about us, what kind of reception we had with you. I need to stop, of course, what's going on here. 
Well, Paul, the apostles, are saying, well, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to be exact, are saying to the church at Thessalonica that the folks in Macedonia and Achaia who had heard of the Christian faith, who had heard of the, the, the uh, work of the Thessalonian church, that they reported what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. And of course, I don't have my notes here uh, right now. However, you could go back to the book of Acts and you could read it quite a bit about Thessalonica. I want to say it's like Acts chapters 16, 17, somewhere within that time, that period, that, that part of your Bible. Um, you could go there and read about Thessalonica. It was an idolatrous place. And uh, the beauty of these Jews and these Gentiles turning from pagan ideas and uh, whether it's the Jews turning from the customs that they had cleaved to or the Gentiles, uh, this was something rather beautiful to Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. So, uh, and also obviously to the saints that were in Macedonia and Achaia. So he goes on to say here in verse 10, and of course, this is where we're going to focus on, and to wait. So they've turned from the living, from, excuse me, they've turned from idols, not living, uh, to a living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So the first thing I have to mention here uh, to give you some resources would be uh, I preached a sermon series called Thinking Through Thessalonians, matter of fact, around this time last year. And I'll make sure I provide a link for you that you can get not only the sermon links, but also the bulletin covers that I, I provide bulletin notes and so forth in my sermons. I'll provide that for you uh, in our update this week. Also, Dr. Don K. Preston, I joked in our back room before we went live that Don Preston has probably covered uh, Thessalonians more than anyone I know. He actually wrote a commentary called We Shall Meet Him in the Air. Uh, I know he often mentions that commentary as being one of the most exhaustive commentaries on the book of Thessalonians that he's come across. And I don't know that he's showing favoritism to himself. I think he's showing you that he studied through most of those commentaries and believes his work to be sufficient. However, a quick point from Don that I bring up when I talk about the Thessalonian text here would be, uh, he kind of created this uh, summary. He said, what we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 is the preaching of the gospel, is the persecution of the saints, is the power of the gospel, or the power of God for that matter, and the coming of the Lord, the parousia. This is the eschatological theme uh, that we find in 1 Thessalonians 1, which also correlates to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, I think it's safe for us to say tonight that when you read Thessalonians, you should be thinking about what Jesus said in Matthew chapters 23 through 24. Uh, that's a great place to start as a foundation for understanding the coming of the Lord. Another resource would be Daniel Rogers. Daniel Rogers, uh, he did a, a sermon series preaching through, or not a sermon series, I'm sorry, he covered a, a, at a conference he preached through Thessalonians. And he did a great job preaching through 1 Thessalonians, looking at 1 Thessalonians 1.4, as I've already mentioned, God's choosing and electing these people to turn from idols to the one true God. And he made note of the time texts that should be considered when we understand the fulfillment of these events. Uh, for example, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, the apostle, apostles write this, but we, brethren, having been bereft of you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see you to your face. So here we know the short while is not, this isn't some sort of a metaphoric phrase. It's not something that we, you know, we are at liberty to say, well, yeah, a short while could be 2,000 years. No, this literally meant that they had been, uh, they hadn't been around the Thessalonian church for a short while, and that short while was maybe a couple of years. Uh, hard, not something we can say meant thousands of years. Daniel Rogers goes on to say that the church, Christ in us, is the apostolic hope. Uh, ultimately, what we see highlighted in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20, uh, for what is our hope, our joy, our crown of exaltation? Is it not even you? Again, this is the apostles writing to the church. In the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming, for you are our glory and joy. So here you have the apostles saying that the church, the church walking in their calling uh, in the presence of God is ultimately their hope, their, their joy. And how the coming of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, is the same mentioned by Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 16, 
verses 27 through 28. Uh, here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through, as I said, 11 through 13, I'm just going to go ahead and read them to you. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. So obviously I'm going to posit that the same coming we're talking about in 1 Thessalonians 1 uh, verses 9 through 10 is the same coming that we're talking about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 as well as chapters 4 and 5. Uh, so and as per Daniel Rogers, uh, Matthew chapter 16 verses 27 through 28 uh, is a foundation text for that. And many of us know Jesus gives us a time statement there that that coming would occur when? while some of those standing in front of him were alive. Uh, that coming could not be uh, the transfiguration, obviously, because we know uh, not only does he appear with angels, but he gives rewards. And I don't know too many folks that would say that he gave rewards uh, at the transfiguration, other than maybe the revealing of himself. However, that's not what's being said there in that text in Matthew chapter 16, 27 through 28. So now back to our text. Obviously, we read verse 10, and what we have to discuss is the wrath to come. What is or what was the wrath to come? This is covenant language. I don't know that I have to really uh, spend too much time belaboring that because most of us here have journeyed through these past 35 sessions where we saw the Old Testament talk about the wrath of God that was going to be revealed against the wicked. This was covenant language used by the prophets. Uh, the wrath of God is a judgment upon the Jews primarily. However, the Gentiles would be affected. Uh, they were affected by the Jews not walking in obedience to the law. Uh, we saw in Deuteronomy 4, that was what Israel was called to do. Uh, if they didn't do it, unfortunately, they became a byword among the nations, and God's name was blasphemed among the nations. So the Gentiles were affected by Israel's disobedience. And yes, the Gentiles will be affected by Israel's judgment, the coming of the Lord. Uh, that, would that would be a time when they, the rendering of rewards joy, glory, uh, and for some, condemnation, uh, devastation, and destruction. Those of the flesh, uh, primarily those under the law, uh, or secondarily those influenced by idolatry. The reward for those uh, in Christ was the glory of the new covenant, Mount Zion, uh, being established and confirmed as a reality in Christ. No more having to deal with Jewish persecutors, no more Gentile powers uh, that seemed to abate their, their mission, uh, especially those who had escaped the Roman Jewish war uh, that, devast that devastated the city of Jerusalem and its inhabitants by heeding the commands of Christ to flee to the mountains. What better of a reward uh, than to find yourself safe from the judgment that happens upon a city? I imagine, uh, you know, as they heard of what happened in Jerusalem, those that were gathered in Pella would have been rejoicing and saying, thanks be to God that we listened to Jesus Christ, our Lord. I know uh, Nathan Du Bois years ago published an article, said that the most encouraging thing we can say to one another as Christians is, remember Pella. So the wrath uh, that was revealed against the Jews and the Romans uh, was their own wickedness as they brought devastation into the city of Jerusalem, each having their own ideas. The Jews, you know, we're going to be victors and preserve this city for ourselves. Uh, you know, and then there were some Jews that worked with the Romans, of course, Josephus, who we get a lot of our history from, was one of those uh, Jews that worked sort of with the Romans uh, in their armies. And then, of course, he also worked with the Zealots. Again, another conversation for another time. Uh, however, what we saw happen during the Roman Jewish War was both of these groups, Jews and Romans, uh, devastated the city of Jerusalem through war, uh, brought calamity upon all the inhabitants, and, uh, you, you know, they surely brought no glory to God nor to themselves. Both the kingdom, both kingdoms of the world uh, would eventually find devastation. And we know the saints who heeded Christ's command to flee to the mountains were saved. Talk about being saved from wrath. So what was the goal? What does it mean to be rescued from the wrath to come? I wrote here in my notes, the goal of the coming was for Christ to demonstrate his presence with the saints, past, present, future, through the church. And that's where I would wrap up my thoughts on the wrath. I believe the wrath was shown against that generation and that wrath 
came and brought devastation upon some and revealed glory and reward for others as they heeded the words of Jesus Christ. So uh, that's what I believe is going on in 1 Thessalonians 1, the simple warning to this church. And with that, I want to go ahead and move us over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And here in chapter 4, I'm going to go ahead and read to us verses 13 through 18, uh, which tend to be the, uh, you know, the summation of this chapter here. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. Now, real quickly, let me remind us, we just read chapter 1. Now, we know this was a letter. This wasn't a chapter book. Uh, this chapter 1 is telling them that they're going to be rescued from the wrath to come. And in the midst of this conversation... Uh, there's come about some being confused, and we'll read this right here, about those that had fallen asleep. And that's going to be important in our discussion tonight. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, now that we've told you you're going to be saved from the wrath to come through Jesus Christ, about those who had fallen asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So notice here, their question, their qualms, if you will, is about those that had fallen asleep in Jesus. What about them? Are they gone? Should we be grieved in the spirit that they didn't get to live up to the day of the Lord, that they were persecuted by these Jewish persecutors, Gentile persecutors? What should we be, what, what should we be thinking about that? For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now, I'm sure most of us have heard sermons on Thessalonians that hardly brought comfort and would have brought no comfort at all to the first century Thessalonian church. So that's what we need to be asking ourselves is, what are Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy saying to these Christians there at Thessalonica that are believers uh, about their confusion regarding those that had fallen asleep? And also, this should cause us to give grace and uh, be gracious to one another in our interpretations that here... These are folks that were far closer to the time of Jesus and are rubbing shoulders with the apostles of Jesus, and yet they have confusion. They're saying, well, what about my, my brother who you know, became a believer in Jesus, but then he was persecuted and martyred, martyred for the faith? What about him? I get that I'm going to live to the great and glorious day of the Lord, but what about him? And this began to create some problems, especially for you know, folks that lived in Thessalonica, let's say Gentiles especially, that didn't quite understand the, the Jewish scheme of uh, resurrection and judgment, uh, didn't understand the afterlife maybe of the Jewish worldview. And uh, you know, here they have their, their families turning from pagan idolatry and going over to this Jewish faith, being martyred for it. And yet they sit there and they're like, well, <laughs> you know, what, what happened to them? And that's what this encouragement is about. Uh, many of you might know this. If you don't, you're going to know now. I believe that the easiest way to qualify what we're reading in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 is to make a distinction between three different groups of people, the living, the people that are alive, that will actually be alive to the coming of the Lord. As we saw, there's a time statement in our text, uh, for we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. So many of us would posit that that's Paul assuming that many of them will be alive at the time of the coming of the Lord. So you have the living. Then you have the asleep that we're talking about here. The asleep are those that had believed in Jesus. Here they're called two different things, the asleep and the dead in Christ. So uh, that would be, uh, if you notice, the asleep was the first part. And then, of course, the dead in Christ is verse 16. So the asleep are the dead in Christ. Those that, again, we know if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've moved out of death into life. So if I've moved out of death into life, I am never to die ever again. Therefore, if I biologically die, and this whole uh, eschatological system of uh, you know, judgment and resurrection has not yet happened, what's my identity? Am I dead? Well, I can't die. So you see where you come up with this confusion. You'd fall asleep. You had fallen asleep in the Lord. 
and you are waiting for the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. So that's your asleep, folks. Then, uh, and again, we're going to lean in on this next week, in 1 Corinthians 15, they're dealing with a different issue. There the issue becomes, well, what about the dead ones? What about those that did not have opportunity to put their faith in Jesus Christ and maybe die and become asleep? They're the dead ones. So you have living, you have the asleep, and you have the dead ones. And I believe if you mark out those three and you follow that frame of thought, it makes these things far easier to understand, especially as we journey toward 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So jumping back in our text here, I noted uh, verse 14, if we believe, so these are folks that believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. This isn't some letter that fell out of heaven to some, you know, person down the block that's learning about the message of Jesus. No, this was a letter written to, to a church of Christians that believed just like Corinthians that we're going to lean in on next week. So what we're talking about here is those that had fallen asleep in Jesus. And I want you to notice that uh, verses um, 13, so you have verse 13 says, we do not want you to be uninformed brethren about those who are asleep. Uh, then you have uh, verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so he will bring with him those that have fallen asleep in Jesus. Uh, then you have verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ, which I'm positing tonight are the dead, are the asleep, uh, shall rise first. And then you have verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, who? Those that were asleep in Jesus. So if you want to get a sort of panoramic picture, it would be the Lord coming with his saints, with his, those that had fallen asleep. They're with the Lord coming with him. And we would, the living would meet the Lord and the living, the fallen asleep saints in the air. And we're going to talk about that here in a moment. And thus, notice the final encouragement here. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Is that not what we're talking about? Is that not the hope of Israel? That they would be with the Lord? That that severed relationship going back to the days of Adam would be restored? And that they would have this opportunity to be in the presence of the Lord? This is what they're encouraging each other with. Don't worry about your friend that or your brother in the faith that has fallen asleep in the Lord prior to the coming of the Lord. He will come with the Lord in judgment. So the contrast would be those that are alive, as you saw right there in verse 17. Now, verse 15, we read, by the word of the Lord. We tell you this by the word of the Lord. And uh, I know Don Preston and uh, many others uh, have offered up that this is a citation from, let's say, Matthew 16, Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13. Uh, you, you know, that's, I think that's important background for this. Uh, some would say that this is just a general word of the Lord, not a citation. Uh, I leave that up to you to uh, find where you, you understand that. Uh, is Paul citing something Jesus had previously said? Uh, or is this a, a general, you know, I have a word of the Lord to tell you? Uh, either way, I don't find it problematic. Uh, I wrote here in my notes, so I just want to go ahead and share with you whatever Thessalonians is dealing with, I will even include 1 Corinthians 15 and the book of Revelation. The details come to fruition at the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord mentioned by Jesus in the aforementioned text, Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13. So now we get into verse 17, and this is where the, the uh, actually, I'm sorry, verse 16, uh, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. We read right in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, uh, we read that the same way you've seen him go into heaven, he will come. So it was just as sure that they saw him ascend, that he will descend uh, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Dr. Don Preston has a great teaching on the trumpet of God and what's going on here. I'm going to leave it to him to give you those uh, details and encourage you to uh, lean in on the resources I'll share in our update uh, later uh, this week. And You'll learn more about that trumpet of God, unless some of you want to share that. Uh, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So there's your encouragement. The dead in Christ are going to be rising with the Lord, are going to be a part of this, this, this um, resurrected picture prior to those that were living. They're going to rise first, those that had fallen asleep. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So, of course, verse 17 uh, brings up three words that we need to talk about this evening. And uh, those three words are harpazo, which my Bible says caught up together with them. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, this has been mistranslated. 
Uh, it's not caught up is not the best uh, way of talking about this, in my opinion. I think caught together is probably the best way of doing uh, talking about it because caught up, unfortunately, as many of you probably know, has given people this idea that we're going to float up into the sky because the word air is there. Well, hello, it says we're going to be caught up into the air. Well, I would ask you, is air right here in front of me or is air only up? So that's a question. We'll get to that here in a moment. So I'm going to be caught up in the air. One of the uh, analogies that I've given that I think best helps us to understand this is a fishing net. You think about it, you throw a fishing net into the, the ocean, the sea, and you pull the fishing net up. The, the point is not that the fishing net came up. The point is what you have together in the net. That's the, the picture we should be ca you know, catched together, caught together are the fish that are in the net. So harpazo, this Greek word, is not supposed to be or is better translated caught together rather than caught up. So let's see how that would work. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So now uh, clouds, unfortunately, causes people to say, well, look, Mike, it says in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Well, if the Lord comes with clouds, then that's where the Lord is. He's in clouds. And we know that that's not literal language. That's the Lord always came with clouds, even in the Old Testament. That's a picture of judgment. It's a picture many people would offer up that when the horses would run through the desert, it would kick up clouds. That was a coming of the Lord. So we're going to be caught with them in the clouds. And whatever move of God is happening, this coming of the Lord, that he comes with the clouds, we are going to meet them in the air. Matter of fact, before I get to air, there's another word I have to bring up, apontesis in the Greek. And apontesis is the word for meet them. And what this gives us a picture of is in the ancient world, when a king would come to a city, the people of that city would go out and greet the king outside the city gates, and then they would all kind of in a triumphant uh, picture there, kind of sort of what we see with Jesus on Palm Sunday, uh, that Palm Sunday celebration where the people meet him outside the city gates as he's journeying toward Jerusalem, they lay the palm branches before his feet, and then they journey with him as he goes into the city. Uh, that's what, how they would have uh, you know, welcomed kings in the ancient world. So what we see happening here is so we're going to be caught together with them, that's the dead in Christ, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And again, I'm positing in the clouds tonight is the, the coming of the Lord. It's the work of God. So we're going to be caught together, brought, you know, we're going to be bind together like a net with them, that's the dead in Christ, in the move of God. I think that's the best way to translate that, to meet the Lord. So that's that apontesis, to meet the, the Lord, you know, welcome him like a king in the air. Now, most folks, again, because it says clouds, they think the air means up. Well, that's a whole different Greek word. Uh, telos, I believe, is a word for sky, uh, not the word. No, it's not telos. Don't quote me on that. Um, either way, uh, there's another word for uh, sky. It might be something with a T, but I'm forgetting it right now. Either way, um, the word air here in the Greek is actually air. It's A-E-R rather than AIR in our English rendering. And what this means is spirit. Another place that we might uh, see that mentioned is in 1 Thessalonians 5.10. It says, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, that we may live together with him, live together with him, live in the spirit, live in the air that he lives in. Uh, some would offer up that air there means breath. Again, it's not up. My breath is not up. My breath is right here in front of me. So Obviously, I have to mention Dr. Don K. Preston continues to be an excellent resource for those three words. He's blessed me. And, uh, you know, I would encourage you that if you had any further questions or details about the Greek, because I'm hardly a Greek scholar, I'm not even a Greek student. And uh, that being said, uh, he'd be one that can really lean in on that for you. Now, notice verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So what we need to do now is we need to double back, even going back to chapter one. What is being made known here in this letter that should provide comfort? Now, again, I think it's important for us to remember the issue. These folks are uninformed regarding those who have fallen asleep, verse 13, 1 for, Thessalonians 4, verse 13. So what we need to do is we need to kind of consider what are the apostles trying to do? Uh, they're trying to help them have a right understanding. And I wrote here in my notes, helping you, us helping others think rightly about these things. That's what provides comfort. The apostle saying, let us, 
let us help you. Let us help you get a better understanding of what's going on here. And that's why they outline what my estimation is prophetic thought regarding the coming of the Lord. So in conclusion, uh, that's what I would say about these Thessalonian texts. I don't believe that they, uh, you know, they're texts that should be brought up against. If, we've, if you've been tracking with me these 34 sessions, I don't know how someone would say, well, what about First Thessalonians? Doesn't that prove your view wrong? In my estimation, it actually proves my view. It goes right along with what we've been saying about this uh, restoration, this uh, resurrection picture uh, of restored relationship rather than some sort of ethereal obsession that folks have kind of foisted upon the text. I mentioned to you that I have a, a whole sermon series where I preach through 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. I do want to encourage you to check it out. I'll be sharing the link in the update so uh, you'll be able to access those resources and perfectly you'll see the consistency of what I'm sharing with you tonight as well as in those sermons. The Thessalonian texts reveal the first century church waiting for the coming of the Lord, that which would bring wrath prior to salvation. This was the pattern of the Old Testament prophets. Judgment and wrath would be revealed, and through that judgment and wrath would come salvation and hope. Once we discern that the coming of the Lord, the wrath of God, was revealed against that generation, right in line with the time statements, we understand the gathering of the Lord, the gathering to the Lord, excuse me. We understand resurrection. We understand it was taking place then. A resurrection that affected the living, the asleep, and yes, the dead. A resurrection that restored God's people to his presence. So I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm encouraged to hear what some of you have to share this evening. So I will go ahead and begin to unmute some mics. And uh, if you have questions, comments, concerns, please throw them in the mix. Edward, I heard your chair, brother. What's going on? <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so much to say on this topic. It's so wonderful. Um, well, time statements is so important in this uh, context be, or in this area. Because um, especially when you have those uh, that talk about uh, us being her heretical due to the fact that we, we feel that uh, the dead has been raised already uh, and we're post uh, 70 AD, you know, uh, uh, because if you were to study the scripture, you know, the scripture clearly states, you know, um, there will be um, some standing here, not one stone left upon another, uh, when the shattering of the holy people, uh, you have, you know, so many different uh, things that are saying uh, when, when this would occur. Sure. Uh, it's important to study the scripture, you know, to show yourself not only approved, but, you know, that you won't be not informed you want to be informed like the scripture had told us we should be um also in uh first thessalonians one where it talks about um them being delivered from the wrath to come and then you know how it talks about um some of them standing there uh and things of that nature using that same language you know that some of them standing there will, 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 will be at that last day of the Lord, or the last time of the Lord, you know, because it took a couple of days. <laughs> and also, um, yes, the restoration, of course, uh, of Pella, you know, those that obey, listen to the scripture, you know, and obey Jesus, you know, command you to flee. They fled and they were saved. And those that you know felt that they wanted to fight against the Romans or those that uh, wanted to conspire with the Romans or whoever you know that stayed in the city, you know, they suffered the consequences of not uh, following what Jesus had uh, said that would save them from the wrath to come. Um, uh, Jesus' reward had come with him, uh, which was very important as far as time statements are concerned, that uh, would prove that when Hymenaeus and Philitus said that uh, uh, the resurrection had occurred and stuff like that, where was the reward, you know, and things of this nature. So 
all of these things, you know, require a time, uh, uh, time statement. Because if you look at all of the prophecies, you know, prophesying the end of the age and the blessings the, and the cursings that would occur, and you look at, you know, what has been fulfilled and there's time statements that will tell you, you know, because Jesus, he, the, God doesn't do anything without informing the prophets. So therefore, you know, all things that we believe, we believe all things have been fulfilled because we can prove it through scripture. Um, because the scripture will tell you, you know, the times that it said these things would be fulfilled. And, and, and in ca some cases it would, it requires faith because it's beyond our physical vision because some things are invisible like his kingdom, you know? So we understand that it has come and all things have been fulfilled because Jesus said it would at a particular time, it would with the shattering of the holy people, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the city, you know, that Babylon, that, uh, that Sodom in Egypt, that uh, Israel had displayed with the idolatrous behaviors and in Revelation, of course, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, you know, which is the end of all, you know, that all things have been fulfilled. Thank you. Let him go. Give that man a pulpit. Um, you know, thank you, brother. Good, good word. And uh, I did want to say, um, go, just harping on one thing that you talked about there with Hymenaeus and Philitus. You see, the problem would be that if Hymenaeus and Philitus were, tr were correct, that the resurrection had already occurred, then what that would cause one to say is, well, then didn't Jesus say he would fulfill every jot and tittle of the law? Well, if Jesus said he would fulfill every jot and tittle, and we know not every jot and tittle was fulfilled uh, by the time, let's say, uh, 60 AD, well, then maybe Jesus isn't the Messiah. You see the problem? You yeah. see that's what would end up happening. Or uh, I thought that, you know, Daniel said that the shattering of the power of the holy people would occur, and then the resurrection would occur. Well, if Jesus is the Messiah, maybe Jesus is doing away with the law. Well, now we have a problem because Jesus said he wasn't doing away with the old covenant, that he was fulfilling it. So, and then you see where it could just create all these sort of qualms and problems. And it did. That's why you have some at Corinth eventually saying, well, there is no resurrection. Now they're totally confused. So, uh, you know, I think it's really important for us to see the problems with the Hymenaeus and Philitus approach, a pre-AD 70 idea of the resurrection of the dead, when, dead ones. And then of course, to appreciate what we're saying that Jesus Christ, by, you know, by the time of AD 70 had fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law, uh, obviously uh, being conclusive with the shattering of the power of the holy people. And so, that's why it's so important of studying the scriptures because you have people like Paul correcting, you know, the false teachings and, the ideas that we may have that's contrary to scripture. That's right. Amen. Anybody else want to jump in and share some thoughts? Edward, I thank you for your participation, brother. Thank you. Vicki, I see you're unmuted. You want to jump in? Yes. So Thessalonian and uh, what's the difference between what we are studying now, which is more in detail than uh, than Hebrew nine twenty eight, that he came second time for salvation. That's a good question. So the, the Hebrew, the letter to the Hebrews was that's responding to a bit different of a question. Uh, the Hebrew Christians would have had more of a a hard time. What it seems, at least, is that uh, there were Hebrew Christians that were having a hard time understanding how Jesus was fulfilling every jot and tittle of the law or how Jesus was providing a better resurrection, a better uh, covenant, you know, all the different themes. I think they say the word better is found in the book of Hebrews, uh, you know, abundantly. Uh, so the book of Hebrews is helping us understand why Christ and the covenant he's bringing in is better than the old covenant it is the fulfillment of the old covenant. Whereas the Thessalonian letter is written to uh, an audience that's clearly having, and, and it's a very early letter. Hebrews is written quite a bit later. Uh, Thessalonians is responding early on to some of the issues that Christians would have had in some of these communities that let's say the apostle Paul had, excuse me, the apostle Paul had planted as he went about on his missionary journeys. So it's just a bit earlier of some of the confusion. By the time Hebrews was written, Thessalonians had already been dispersed. And, you know, that confusion was cleared up. 
uh, regarding the, those that had fallen asleep, but Hebrews is just giving yeah. a, a more exhaustive understanding of how Christ is fulfilling the old covenant law. Did that make sense, yeah. Vicki? Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No, not me, not yet. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Matt, I see you're unmuted. You want to jump in here and have some questions, comments, concerns sure. as well? Yeah, no, this is a, definitely a good book to study. Um, just to kind of comment on what Vicki said, um, I think if you look at chapter five of First Thessalonians, um, it kind of says basically the same thing as Hebrews uh, in verse nine, God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation mm -hmm. through our Lord Jesus Christ. So um, I think that that sort of says the same thing that Hebrews is saying that, you know, he's coming again for salvation. Amen. Um, you know, anyways, um, I wanted to just make a mention of um, chapter one where you were talking about verses nine and 10 and you're talking about Doug Wilson. And um I just wanted to say, like, I think for people like Doug Wilson or like maybe partial preterists, um, I, what will really help me to kind of come to the full preterist understanding um, wasn't that be, I wanted to be a heretic. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants that. Um, but it was just seeing the, all of the connections. You know, just and I and I think when when we, especially when we're looking at uh, the wrath that is mentioned so often in almost every New Testament book, um, I think we have to go back to the first time that it was mentioned in the New Testament to understand what what is this wrath, what is this judgment that they're talking about? Because I know partial pre preterists will will say, well, Jesus came in judgment, but then there's another, you know, judgment basically looming somewhere in the distance. Um, and to me, that's kind of, uh, you know, I used to be there, but to me, that's kind of uh, misunderstanding what exactly is this judgment? What exactly is the wrath? And I think when you just go back to Matthew chapter three, John the Baptist is the first one who says anything about that. And so we have to understand it from that context first, and then see, does every other mention kind of you know does it fit with what he's saying i think it does so i just want to say that first that's a, if i may just piggyback off what you're saying that's a great point man and i appreciate that you brought us back to matthew 3 uh because first off we don't see the audience there in matthew 3 having you know being confused about the wrath of god clearly they have some sort of preconceived idea which we know comes from the prophets uh that you know the wrath to come you, you know they understood where it was coming from and i don't see uh, in the New Testament, where it says, okay, well, that was the wrath for this generation, and then there's another picture of wrath that's going to come at some far later time. We just don't see that uh, being done. Exactly. So, well said. Yeah. Um, and then in, uh, oh, another thing I noticed as just as you were kind of going through the, the text was um, there, the mention of, of the second coming is in every chapter of this book. Yeah, every single chapter mentions the second coming. I had never really noticed that before, but um, thought that was cool. Um, but in First Thessalonians four, uh, I kind of just wanted to highlight a couple cool, um, you know, connections. Um, and then I wanted to talk about verse seventeen a little bit more because that's that is the. That is the tricky one. Um, but in verse 14, you know, Paul says that uh, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And then, and then he says, we who are alive and remain in the, in the next verse uh, will also be uh, with him. And I think, I, I just remember when I read this the first time and I, and I was just like, this is exactly what Paul is talking about. When Jesus actually says, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. So that's the dead will rise, right? Even if they die, the dead will rise. Mm -hmm. And then he even says, and everyone who lives will never die. That's the we who are alive and remain. Everyone who lives 
will never die. Mm -hmm. I, it was just, it was such a cool, um, it was almost like Paul was, um, you know, it's like he, he heard it from, from Christ himself, you know, he's just sort of uh, explaining it there. Um, there's a lot of other connections too, but I'll, I'll just name a couple like in verse 16. Um, I think first Corinthians 15 is almost identical to what, what's being said there uh, with all the language, with the trumpet. Uh, it's talking about the dead being raised. Um, and Paul talks about that in that, in verse 52 of, of, of uh, chapter 15, you know, he says that at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and then the dead will be raised. That's what he said. He goes, um, the trump with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's like exactly the same language. So we know he's talking about the resurrection. I remember using, I remember, um, um, bringing th someone through, uh, those connect that connection right there when they were like oh this is the rapture you know i remember like trying to help someone understand this is talking about the resurrection you know um and that was that was one of the verses i used and then um in verse 17 so like i have to admit this is this, this definitely is a tricky like the words are just strange um i like the way that you explained it um that you know the way i like to think about it is like you know um when when christ came in the clouds in judgment then it was it was almost like the, all the saints and paul even says that all the saints will be with him you know in in like in in that judgment not obviously like physically killing people right but they will be with him like in spirit in, in, in some way. Like it's kind of hard to explain, hard to imagine, but um, that's the picture that I get is that, you know, it, he's saying we, that we will be caught up together in, in the clouds. And we know that Christ has, you know, came in the clouds. So, so what else can that mean? But that somehow they will join Christ in the judgment and the restoration, you know, in a spiritual sort of sense. I don't really, I, otherwise, yeah, you kind of have to go. It sounds like everyone's being, you know, vacuumed up into the air, you know. Um, otherwise, it's like, what do you, you know, what, what else is it saying? Um, and one, one text that I think in the Old Testament, not that the words are the same, or like the, the original words are the same, but I think the, the, the general meaning kind of fits what Paul is saying with this is in Amos 4.12, uh, the last part of that verse says, prepare to meet your God, mm -hmm. right? And that's talking about a, a sort of judge in a judgment way, right? Not in a, not in a nice way. Um, and so like, I, I reference that because it's, I don't know how to explain it. I guess it seemed to fit a little, it seemed to fit a little bit to me that it was, you know, they're, they're going to meet him in, in this sort of spiritual sense of judgment, but also like they're going to be with him. I don't Amen. know if that makes any sense. If I might say this on, on the heels of what you're saying. So uh, Lynn Hiles, he preached a sermon on this and he said, uh, the best way we should look at this word air and then the clouds all here is that we will breathe together. So in the Lord's coming in judgment, we will breathe together, or he even said, we will conspire together. In other words, we'll all be a part of this work of God, this, uh, this mission of God to bring judgment and his presence, bring judgment upon the adversaries, obviously. And that's important because if you remember, going back to chapter two, uh, the apostles, they really belabor the, uh, those that are being persecuted. So it, it's important for them to see the judgment, right, upon that generation, uh, vengeance, which obviously... Uh, you know, Don would want me to trace it all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy, which I agree, you know, that was the, the, the vengeance upon the adversaries uh, of, of the people of God. So, yes, we're going to be a part of that. And that's what the incurred, not us, but you, hopefully, you know, in line with our discussion here, what he's saying to the Thessalonian church is we're going to be a part of that coming judgment. We're going to be we're going to be conspiring with God. We're going to be with him. Don't worry. Don't despair. Uh, you know, don't worry about your those that have fallen asleep to keep it in the context there. Uh, we're going to be with the Lord in judgment and uh, we're going to be with him forever. So not only are we going to come with him in the clouds, but we're going to remain with him forever. 
So yeah, I, I, I kind of, I think what you said, I think you may have said it better than I'm saying it. So I'm sorry that I'm, I'm piggybacking, but I appreciate the way that you, uh, you had marked that out there. Yeah. And just to sort of drive that home a little bit, I'll just the last thing I'll say is um, sometimes I've noticed um, the words in a particular verse and even in the Greek or in the Hebrew or whatever, um, like if you look up harpazo in the Greek, it, it, it literally means to be to take by force. Like that's the way it's used when Jesus uses it. Uh, violent men take it by force. Uh, he, he'll be carried off with his property. Uh, um, my favorite verse, you know, the, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Um, you know, it, or Philip being snatched away, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Even that imagery seems similar to what Paul is saying. But um, sometimes like I found that the the words can almost like sometimes it's not just what what do the words say and how is it used all the time sometimes it actually really matters um like what is the message that's coming across if i'm if i'm saying that correctly i'll, I'll give you an example and and then i'll be done um actually in the next in the next chapter um because i had this discussion with someone once where in the next chapter in chapter five paul talks about he uses these words like uh, sleep and and being alert or being sober so he like the you know those contrasting words and in the first half of chapter five verses one through eight or something um the word for sleep and the word for uh like yeah the word for the word for sleep i believe it refers to death and the and the word for alert and sober is like being ready, but he's talking about, you know, uh, what he's trying to say is, uh, you know, to be ready to not be involved in, in the behavior that, you know, like he says, like some of these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. These who exhibit this, you know, kind of behavior, he's trying to say that, like, be your sons of the light. You're not sons of the darkness. You're, you know, don't get drunk and don't do this, you know? So that's understandable. But then in verse 10, he says, so that whether we are awake or asleep, and those are two different words in the Greek. They're not the same words that he just used in, let's say, chapter uh, verse six, sleep and alert. They're not the same. They're not the same words. And, and so one would think if you read this in, in context, or, or if you're just reading with those words, it sounds like, well, uh, then Paul is saying, and it, it, Paul is saying, uh, if you believe in Christ, then uh, whether you are ready or not, right. uh, you will live together with the Lord. That is obviously not what Paul is saying. So sometimes we have to look at the message, like what is the actual message in context of, of what, is, what is Paul is saying, rather than just, well, the word is used this way, mm -hmm. and this is what this word means. So it's not talking about death there, you know, but it's like, so I feel like that's what's going on also in chapter four. You know, we can get so confused with caught up and in the clouds and in the air and meeting the Lord. And I think just the me the general message is like what we were saying. It's just they will be part of that, you know, that coming of, of the Lord. Not that they'll literally be, you know, caught up into the air because that's what the word means. Or that they will go into the clouds because it says clouds, you know. If, if that makes sense that was kind of a long rant but oh, hey that wasn't a rant at all brother that was that was excellent and i think you made an excellent point i don't think i know you did because i know some that have struggled with that exact issue where they've said that you know well wait a minute if you're going to say asleep in first thessalonians 4 is those that had biologically died well then you have to carry that over to right. first Thessalonians 5 and then obviously it starts to sound wonky so you you, you explained yourself very well i appreciate that and i yeah. think you kind of put that to bed I, I highlighted those verses because I do think uh, you kind of need to take the, like you said, you need to take the spirit of the conversation rather than piecing out the words. I don't want people to do that to me. You know, you ever say the wrong word and then somebody just sits there and harps on the yeah. back, said the wrong word. It's like, dude, did you catch what I was saying? Yeah, right. that. So, yeah. um, you know, so yes, I, I 100%, I, I appreciate what you said there and thank you. Yeah. I also, I think I misspoke though. It's the words that he uses for sleep and awake in chapter four 
are not the same in chapter five. That's that's what I meant to say. All right. I caught the spirit of what you were saying, you see? You did. <laughs> it was important. Thank you, brother. Jonathan, I see you're unmuted. You want to jump in here? Yeah, this is just absolutely fantastic. I appreciate Matt. I appreciate it bringing up the fact you can do a lot with etymology and people do this with, you know, actually I got tickled one time. One of my best friends owns a bookstore. And I remember years ago when I was first getting to know him, uh, there was a lady came in and uh, she was asking for um, a book to help her learn Greek, uh, to, to learn the Greek words of scripture. And my friend was like, well, have you had a Greek class? She said, uh, no, I just want to, I just want to get a book. He said, well, you don't need the book if you've not, if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I thought, uh, well, just sell her the book, <laughs> you know, but he was just really adamant. He said, no, you need to go take a class. And he, he gave her a couple of, um, uh, you know, there's a few local colleges that, uh, uh, you know, she could go take a Greek course and and he, he also said something. He said, yeah, and you need to take some, uh, some, you know, at least introduction to theology and some hermeneutics, you know, you could do, you could, you could really screw up a lot of things. <laughs> it's just, uh, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what words mean. And I, I thought, uh, you know, of course, I, like I said, if it's me, I just sell the book and forget it. But he was really passionate about, you know, hey, uh, yeah, don't don't just do that. <laughs> but unfortunately, you do. I mean, we've all got caught up in that before, and it's easy to do that. But I really like the point Matt was making that you got to look at the broader context and the conversation. And, and I think all that's great. Um, I've, I've even read some scholars get hung up on the etymology of some words and, and they can do a lot of dance with it that doesn't, doesn't really help. But uh, I just wanted to throw something out there for, for you guys to think about. I know a lot of times the charge toward full preterists is that uh, we talk about the corporate aspects of resurrection, but we don't really say much about maybe the individual aspects of it. And I know that's one thing that we try to do in our circles that we're in. We don't, we don't advocate that everybody has to do this, but just, uh, I guess one thing to think about, I know we do hold to the corporate body view and, uh, but we hold that as like a pattern for, uh, you know, the broader, you know, what, what would happen in that event, in 70 AD and the culmination of all that, but we, we would see that as a pattern for, okay, uh, what do we do individually now past that? And I'm, I'm afraid it's where the IO guys and a lot of these people get hung up of, well, uh, if, if you take the corporate body view and that's it, then there's nothing else. But uh, we take the position that uh, the individual responsibility is to, we take that process of resurrection and uh, we apply it you know, to our faith and our life, because uh, we all have to go through uh, trial, crucifixion, uh, transformation in order to, to, to be resurrected. So we have to tear down the old and build up the new. And Paul teaches this throughout his letters. You know, he says, um, don't just stop lying, uh, put on truth. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you can't stop lying without telling the truth. You have to do both. And I learned a lot of this in neuthetic counseling and confrontational counseling years ago. Um, and and, and I, I really started to incorporate that as what I call judgment. I know we believe, of course, the corporate judgment and all that was fulfilled in 70 AD. But uh, personal judgment is, for me, that neuthetic encounter of you know, hey, I need to do, I, I, I realize I, I got to fix something in my life. But the only way to do that is to tear down the old ways that I thought about this situation or whatever circumstance I have. And that uh, I have to go through that process of tearing this down and being raised up again, uh, so I can approach this problem uh, with some newness. So uh, we, we kind of, I, I know this is pushing the boundaries at times, but that's what we're called to do because I think we're called to a faith that equips us, uh, you know, toward, um, you know, uh, wholeness and, and uh, fulfillment, not, in, you know, in, in life. And um, this, is the, this is the criticism we get a lot of times is uh, we take people's hope away from them because we don't talk so much about the afterlife. But uh, for us, talking about 
salvation is more than just talking about uh, swapping soul substance, mm -hmm. but it's more about uh, the, the radical process of empowering us to be able to fulfill our lives and to, to change for the better. And we know we can't do that on our own. So uh, uh, like I said, I, I would just sort of propose that as a way maybe uh, that us preterists can and say, you know, uh, we don't believe it all just stops at 70 AD. And we do have, um, like Don and others have said, you know, we do believe that you have to live and, uh, you know, and, and you want to enjoy things in the, in the world. And, and you can't do that in chaos. And you can't do that just living it up any way you want. That um, uh, it's like I tell people lots of times, I, I, I'm definitely more, more uh, as far as my politics, I'm much more of a libertarian and I'm that way personally. But that doesn't mean I think you should just be able to do anything. That means uh, taking personal responsibility. So uh, I think that's, as, especially as a, as a full preterist, uh, I don't think because um, that the final judgment was fulfilled in 70 AD that somehow I'm excluded now from, uh, you know, my life needing to get better <laughs> or, uh, you know, just l being accepting of anything. And that, that, that's where some have went. I mean, and let's be honest, we've, we've known some to do that. They kind of go off in that direction of almost an atheistic um, uh ethic and um uh, you know we don't necessarily have to do that <laughs> we can uh, take the principles that we have um it's just like i mentioned this past sunday at our church in pikeville kentucky that uh, just like the beatitudes the beatitudes are, are these are principles that we should follow but that doesn't mean that every poor person should be in charge of things because i grew up with a lot of poor people that don't need to be in charge of anything because uh, uh, I know they would abuse that power. <laughs> so, and it's just like Jesus talking about the rich. He's not talking about all rich people are horrible. Uh, he's just talking about people that are rich that abuse their their wealth and status and power and uh, just make a show of it. Just like uh, all poor people aren't great people either. Because trust me, I've grown grown up around a lot of them in the Appalachia area, and uh, there's some good poor people, and then there's some uh, really horrible. <laughs> uh, poor folks so um the most important thing i i, I guess what i'm getting at is uh we're, we're we're not saying that we're abandoning the idea of resurrection that's why i really appreciate our circles just like uh, you know ed and mike and and matt and all you guys that uh, we're having these conversations where it's not just putting it in the past but we believe that um you know god is work right now in this reality and is moving us toward some, you know, things better here. And we're, we're not just having to wait to go to an afterlife to enjoy it. But so the one thing I really love about the preterist uh, perspective is it uh, is very much uh, helping us to focus on things that we can change now and hopefully change our world for the better. And the only way to do that is to start with us. So. But I just kind of throw that out there, maybe just to get us to thinking about that. Maybe that's a good direction to go, uh, you know, just where we can say, hey, you know, it's we believe in the corporate body, but th that's not all of it. You know, that um, there are other aspects to this, too, that we have to take as a personal and an individual, because um, especially if if you're um, if, if you're more in the Trinitarian framework, you believe in the one and the many. So, you know, you believe in the corporate aspects of the Christian faith, but there's also the individual aspects of it. So those, Amen. all those things work together. Amen. I appreciate that about your ministry, Jonathan. I do. I definitely, I'm sorry I cut you off. Please continue. No, 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 no. Go ahead. I, uh, I've got more, you, you know me, I've got a lot more questions and I'm throwing <laughs> ideas out there and, uh, there there's times I, I could I could tie scriptures together and I could tell you what words mean and you know I've done all that over the over the years and I'm just in a different place now so I appreciate people that do that I mean I appreciate guys that come on and can tie these things together and you know make a beautiful picture out of the scriptures but then I appreciate also other folks that are trying to connect with people and you know, how does this play out? <laughs> how, how, does this, how does this help us to go out and help people? So that's- uh, I think I'm following you well. And um, I believe, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, 
with the individual aspect of being identified with Christ because we all bring our glory into the body. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also that, uh, you know, uh, testimony, like it states in Revelation, is very important to help individuals grow. You know, that people are not alone in this. And also that um, uh, we all make up the body of Christ. We all know that, you know, that's the importance of, of gathering together that we may iron sharpen, sharpening iron and things of this nature, you know, but individuality, you know, brings in, you know, that flavor that, you know, that we need to help us grow. You know, it, 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 it expands our horizons, yeah. you know, because, you know, if everyone was come from where we come from and that's all we know, you know, we know nothing about, you know, certain other people's ethnicity or whatever, you know, that can help us in our growth, you know, from experiences because, you know, because life experience, you know, is very good and helpful, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, that's basically, you know, what I had kind of gotten from you, you know, yeah, bringing that individual that. aspect, you know, bringing that glory into, you know, the kingdom or into the body, you know. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I'll just sort of say this to supplement it and then you guys can can take over. But it's just, I, I think that's the problem we have a lot of times with the partial preterists. And, and I, I know these guys because I'm around them all the time. We have these conversations is... Um, you know, they're, they're waiting for a resurrection uh, out of the graveyard uh, at the end of time. And, you know, mm -hmm. all that's fine. But, you know, I said, you don't have to wait. <laughs> we, you can actually go through a transformation now. But uh, they, although, although the vast majority of partial predators I'm around are reformed, and they hold a lot of my position on the sovereignty of God, but they don't believe in the absolute sovereignty of God. So uh, that's, that's, this is where we have our, uh, distinctions and uh, I always say you know this is God's world <laughs> and uh, you know he's using us as transformative agents and uh, just like for example Shane Claiborne is somebody that takes guns and breaks them down turns them into uh, works of art and tools and things like that and that's his ministry and then some people I know in my circles get offended at that because you know we all love to be the second amendment type people and and I'm, I'm that way i I believe in having guns, but I'm not out telling people if they don't have a gun, they're stupid. <laughs> you know, or I don't. I don't look at Shane's work as uh, going against uh, my ethic or or what I think you know should be should be done. That's that's his ministry and that's what he's doing and that's how he brings about peaceful transformation. And uh, you know, the, the the good thing about this is um, we can have these diverse ideas and, and and still feel like that we're being these transformative agents God's called us to be uh, here in the world but I, that's what I'm just saying I, I, that's that's what I'm afraid I've, I've, I have seen some full preterists getting this notion that everything's in the past just like partial preterists say everything's in the future and here we're struggling to say hey how about right here <laughs> you know how about right now that uh, probably right now is important because this is the place where we can change and we can, we can help each other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's just where my heart is. Mike knows that he's, he's been in my house and uh, <laughs> we, we try to model that. So uh, as best we can, but uh, anyway, that's this, uh, some things that we, we, we try to practice and we're not, not great at it, but we, we try. Amen. Well, if I might just uh, further bolster that hermeneutic briefly, uh, I would say that, um, you know, one analogy that I wish folks would really catch on to is Bible prophecy was the building of the house. And I don't know too many folks that get in the business of building houses and then just leaving it there. Uh, you know, obviously you move in, you live there, you thrive. Uh, that's the point. So Bible prophecy was moving toward the end of right here in our text, for that matter, First uh, Thessalonians chapter four, verse 17 and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So what I would like to make a charge for all of us full preterists is let's live like people that live with the Lord. Let's live that out. Let's show people what it looks like to have the Lord's presence in our lives. And I believe that's a great outworking of, of exactly what you're sharing there, Jonathan. And also another hermeneutic I would bring up that kind of, in my opinion, at least bolsters 
what you were saying, and we're going to look at this a bit next week. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul's beginning to talk about the resurrection of the dead ones, he uh, or, you know, maybe to make that sound a bit uh, more in line with the wording, it would be the standing again of the dead ones. Uh, when he's talking about that, uh, what he says is, I die daily. And that always gets missed out because people don't realize what Paul's doing is, yes, he's talking about the corporate body view, but he's also making the point that if there is no individual reality to this, if we're not living lives that are in line with what Christ preached about the resurrection of the dead, then this means nothing. And that's what he actually gets at in 1 Corinthians 15 is that, well, if we don't get this right, and I actually said this in my sermon this past week, the resurrection of the dead is very important. You know, this might even bolster our whole study here. Some of you might have been saying for 35 sessions, why am I doing this to myself? Well, let me tell you, uh, you know, getting an understanding of the resurrection of the dead is, according to 1 Corinthians 15, is foundational to why we've been saved by Jesus, how we've been saved by our from our sins. So, and Paul goes on there and he basically says, well, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then you're still in your sins. And I, you know, I die daily, obviously talking about going against, you know, his previous thoughts about the law, et cetera. I die daily to what I'm, you know, what I'm used to. And if there is no resurrection of the dead and I'm dying daily, living this experience, this whole thing is for nothing. We've been fooled, folks. And that's what Paul gets at in 1 Corinthians 15. So there is that individual aspect to this that clearly Paul saw. And, uh, you know, I believe each of us should be impressed by that as well, that we should be saying, you know, I could be out there talking and showing you, you know, how the word harpazo means this and this means this. But if I'm not living in light of the spirit of God, living as one who Christ has raised, this whole thing really doesn't matter. We're just doing a lot of fodder here. Uh, so, you know, I appreciate what you said, Jonathan. And I do believe uh, I actually wrote in my Bible here in this chapter. It's I wrote, keep the context and catch the spirit. That's what we need to be doing is, and it's hard to catch the spirit. Of course, we all know that spirits like the wind, but uh, you know, but again, catch the spirit of the conversation and allow that to inform us of our hermeneutic. Uh, well, uh, is anyone else, uh, Debbie, I know you've been sitting quietly back there. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but just wanted to encourage you. If you wanted to jump in, you can unmute. Uh, anyone else have anything else you want to throw in here? Any questions, comments, concerns to conclude our study this evening? I just wanted to comment on hapazo, the word where he talks about takes by force, because if you notice, Adam was in the midst of chaos, right? So God had to like snatch him out of all of that chaos, you know, to put him into their God. And just as us, you know, being that how we were, you know, living in the world and things of this nature, God had to snatch us out of all of that mess, you know, to teach us how to do good you know, put in our hearts, you know, to study his word and to learn of his precepts and concepts. So, yes. <laughs> Great point about salvation, and you must be one of them covenant creation folks, uh, talking about Adam like that. Uh, however, yes, I definitely appreciate your thoughts, brother. Thank you. Debbie, I see you unmuted. You want to jump in here, have some questions, comments? Um, yeah, just... Um... Uh, let me find it. I guess the phrase when Jonathan was talking, um, I guess the phrase fulfilled hope or hope fulfilled seems to, it, that ties in like how we, yes, we do look to the past. We looked to 8070. We looked at what all that Christ has fulfilled, but then I don't know, like the fulfilled also takes us into the future. Like we have to, I, I just, what you said, Jonathan was rang true. It's, um, there's a lot, there's just so much to be thankful for. It's a, sh it, we've had many conversations with friends and family that are just missing it. And, um, just thankful that our eyes are open because it's, it's not, it's not always looking to the path. I mean, we have such a wonderful, um, I mean, God is just, he's just fulfilled everything in us. And it's just such a wonderful, it's just wonderful to like, want to share that and rejoice and what we're living in now. It, um, it makes us sad when we are at church sometimes or around people that they're still waiting for that hope. Mm -hmm. And, and um, 
we're like, no, it's fulfilled. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's right there. It's done. We have it. We have it now. I mean, even just on Sunday, we, you know, they come so close and then they'll say another fulfillment has to happen or, you know, this is just partially fulfilled. And, and um, so you guys have heard it all before, but it's encouraging, you know, hearing all of you guys' thoughts and everything. Um, I have to think about that in the air. Um, I, you kept mentioning um, in the spirit and I am not that really good at looking at the Greek kind of thing. Simon is better at that than I am. Um, but when I just, I try to use my phone and look it up and it just, it just says breath or breathe. I, I guess I just need to have understanding. I don't, I don't understand how to read that in this spirit, but I like it. So if that truly is how I could explain those verses to someone else, I think that would be helpful for me. Because Amen. the breath that was breathed into Adam, you know, that made him a living soul. You know, you could kind of like look at it like that. And then, you know, uh, it also means, it can, it can mean spirit to us. You know, there's one God, one spirit, one body, you know. So when, when everyone is gathered, you know, together, like Pastor used the analogy, the fishnet, you know, where it, you know, it gathers all of the fish, how, how the sleep and those that are um, awake uh, are gathered um, uh, in one spirit, one mind, one body, you know. But what does that have to do with air? Well, yeah, if well, I'm tracking with you, A-E-R. Yeah, I'm tracking with you. Edward, I think what you're doing, though, unfortunately, and fortunately, is you're, you're repeating what we believe, yes. But what I'm gathering Debbie's saying is, how would I find that proof of that? You, you know, that sounds good. And, mm. uh, you know, uh, I will say, uh, Debbie, I'm right there with you. As I mentioned, uh, hardly a Greek scholar. Uh, you know, Don Preston has done quite a bit of work outlining that word. And I'll go ahead and I'll dig it up and I'll send you some uh, resource in that regard. Um, and also, as I mentioned, Lynn Hiles. So, uh, you know, he's kind of leaned in on that. He talks about it being conspiring together. Breathing together is conspiring together. Um, the simple way I would mark it out would be, and I have to dig up the word, but there's another word for sky. So I think most people, when they read air, they're thinking sky, but that's not the word that's being used here. So the word here, breath, is the atmosphere around us, the air around us. Uh, you know, when you breathe, you breathe out right in front of you, it's your breath. So that's the picture that I'm getting from that word. Uh, however, like I said, uh, there's folks that have leaned in on that far better than I could. So I'll dig that resource up and send it to you. And I believe it'll confirm, you know, what you're hoping it says, and also what we've sort of outlined here this evening. Okay, thank you. Can I jump in there really quick? Absolutely. Um, just to kind of help a little bit, because um, it is confusing, Debbie, I, I agree. Um, if you jump over to Ephesians 2, uh, I think it might give a kind of example of how to, how to understand it a little bit better. Um, so he's, Paul says, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, mm -hmm. according to the prince of the power of the air. What does that, what, what does that mean to you when he says, according to the prince of the power of the air? How would you explain that? Um, I have, I have studied that before. Let me think. course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air um that's the is that the doctrine is that the you know well it's if, okay if I, no it's, yeah go ahead Mike. if i might just jump in the verse actually explains it for us if you notice what the verse is saying it's saying according to the prince of the power of the air and then it goes on of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience the prince of the power of the air was the wickedness that was reigning during that period of time. And that was, again, what was in the atmosphere, the wickedness, the, the, the persecution of the, uh, of the saints. And, and so for me, I, I believe that the power of the air there uh, is talking about a, almost like a, a chiasm where it's explaining it, right? It's repeating it of the spirit. So the prince of the power of the air is the spirit that is working in the sons of the, diso uh, the sons of disobedience. 
So please, uh, Matt, if you had anything you wanted to further add to that, Go ahead, yeah, go. no, I think he, I think that was perfect. The only other thing I would say is I, I just think the word air, like he's he's not saying it's somehow in the air we breathe, right? He's not he's not talking literally. It, it's it's almost like he has no other way. There's no other words to explain these spiritual things, and so that's the best way that we can sort of say it's it's in the air, right? And so in in First Thessalonians, Paul's not saying that we will literally fly up into the air just like he's saying that power isn't in the like molecules you know it's just it's just the way of that's why i was saying like the you kind of have to just catch like the message of like what is he trying to say what what how would you explain this if you were to say it you know in, in this kind of you know what i mean like in this sort of abstract way um i i feel i feel like the the, the wording is almost insufficient to describe what he's really trying to say just because there really isn't good words to explain it so i hope that i hope that helps a little bit but i think those two passages are are should be viewed very similarly uh should be read similarly in the sense of you have to just kind of think about what is he trying to say not what do these words mean not like what does okay. air mean just what is he okay. trying to say yeah okay thank you Great point and good question, Debbie. Absolutely. I, I think that's one that we really should lean in on because it is an exciting point, right? If it's saying that, if it's saying that we're going to be caught together with the Lord in the spirit, that's our hope. I mean, we want to be able to outline that for people and help them understand. So I definitely appreciate that you brought that up. And, you know, for me, I guess I often call, I say atmosphere, right? So it's talking about the atmosphere. But unfortunately, yeah. what I've noticed is some people, when I say atmosphere, they still think of the sky. So I'm like, all right, I, I got to find a new word. Um, but again, I, I really do think that I'll send some resources, I'll dig them up and we'll find a, a little bit more clarity, hopefully through some of the shared resources. Yeah, because I also have here, um, Matthew 1 and I have Luke 3, 23 through 38 and John 12, 4. So, well, let's try one of those. I'm going to try John 12, 4 for a moment here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, John 12, 4, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intending to betray him, said, no, I don't know that it, hmm. yeah, I'm not very sure, uh, Edward, about those citations. Uh, you know, let's be clear here. This, this has eluded scholars for centuries. So, you know, if we, uh, I, I'm not going to pretend that we're going to totally nail it down now. And I don't know any of you have a, a degree in Greek scholarship uh, or Koine Greek scholarship for that matter. Um, you know, it's it's something that I think we would we would do best to lean upon some other resources. I will say one thing about the the different language because I I speak Italian, and um, sometimes it's not. Like, I'm just gonna reiterate what I basically said in a different way. It's just sometimes not about what does that word mean, because right. it can just it depends on how it's used. And I know this from speaking Italian. Um, I don't know if I said this before here or somewhere else, but my wife and I would sometimes play this game where she'll go on Google Translate and uh, and and she'll type something in in English and trans translate it to Italian, and then she'll try to say, she'll try to actually read the Italian, and then ask me what what did I say, and sometimes I'll nail exactly what she said in English, and other times I'm getting the basic gist of what she's saying because it can it can just be said in a few different ways. That's kind of the point, you know. Amen. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that there's a, languages. Yeah, talking to people Spanish, Italian, you know, you ask them, how do I say this in Spanish? And I'll get people that'll say, there is no way to say that in Spanish. I have no idea. So, uh, you know, I think that that's probably what we need to be considering as we're reading these things. Cool. Well, I, uh, I'll go, go ahead and wrap our study up. I thank all of you for your uh, questions, contributions and being a part of this study. Uh, I truly do believe this is a study I couldn't do on my own. That's why I'm glad we did it this way, where we complement each other's thoughts and build up each other's thoughts. Uh, otherwise, I just would have been regurgitating Dr. Don K. Preston, uh, to be quite honest with you. Uh, he's my, my giant that I stand upon his shoulders in these regards. I'm excited because we leaned in on 1 Corinthians 15 a bit tonight, uh, talking about some things, and Matt did us a, a, a great service by helping us notice that 
what we're talking about here in 1 Thessalonians 4 is going to be carry over to 1, Thessalonians, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. I might say that there's a little bit different of a perspective going on there, some different questions that are being asked. However, it's talking about that same event, uh, that coming of the Lord, uh, the resurrection of the dead. So uh, I'm excited to lean in on that next week. I hope that tonight was clarifying for you and that you're seeing this similar thread of uh, restored relationship, restored covenant, restored presence of God. You know, if we have one takeaway tonight, I hope, well, actually, yeah, one takeaway tonight, I would hope that it was that verse where it says, and we shall ever be with the Lord. And if you're listening to this tonight and you're saying, well, how do I know that I'm going to ever be with the Lord? What, what is my hope? What is my reality? I want to highlight what uh, another quote from, um, well, a quote from Jesus, but Matt brought this up. In John chapter 11, uh, Jesus says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day, talking about Lazarus. And he goes on to say, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Matt, if you don't mind, can I ask you to close us on a word of prayer? Sure. Thank you. Lord God, we just thank you for this time together, this edifying time uh, in your word and the fellowship that we have together. Lord, we just thank you for how mysterious and how, how wonderful your word is, how filling and nourishing it is. And we just seek to understand it better just so we can know you better, not so that we're filled with head knowledge, but just so we can have a better walk with you and honor you and worship you more. I just pray that everyone here would have um, learned something from this and, and, and grown closer in the relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight. God bless and go in peace.